Hey everybody, welcome to The Bottom Line. I'm Michael Noland and tonight we continue our trek through the recording sessions for the Sgt. Pepper album. And of course, the recording of John Lennon's magnificent A Day in the Life. Okay, so we've already covered the first recording session for the song by primarily John Lennon, A Day in the Life. That was covered in our Fab Four Friday Forays number seven. And that of course covers primarily the demo making of the song with John Lennon on acoustic guitar and his voice singing the song. Tonight we're going to cover the very first Beatles-centric recording attempt of the song. I gotta say, the first time I heard this album, my vision of the Beatles performing this song was that of John Lennon being on piano, George Harrison on rhythm guitar, Paul McCartney on bass, and of course Ringo on drums. So as I started reading books by Mark Lewison and other great Beatle historians, imagine my surprise that it was actually Paul McCartney at the very prominent instrument of the piano. Now at this point, remember, McCartney had already made a decision to use the bass guitar as an overdub instrument rather than an instrument played right at the start, primarily on the rhythm track. And as Jeff Emmerich brings up, a lot of thought went in to the piano part for this song. It dances around John's vocals. It doesn't step on his rhythm guitar. And in my opinion, not enough has been said about this particular part of the recording. Now for this session, the other three Beatles, aside from John Lennon, were not playing their usual instruments. As we've said, Paul was on piano. George was at first on maracas, with Ringo of course on bongos to add even more flavor. Now of course, true to Jeff Emmerich's true nature, he brings out that of course George Harrison was the one who wasn't keeping a proper beat. So at this point, he takes credit for suggesting to switch George from Maracas over to Bongos and then put Ringo, a steadier timekeeper, on the more essential Maracas. And he even goes on to further say he intentionally buried George Harrison's performance in the mix to the point that it's barely heard on the recording. Lord save us, Jeff Emmerich. But either way, at this session, the Beatles got a basic track and everybody on the recording team truly felt they had a masterpiece in the works. But it's here the Beatles record the very structure of the song itself. This would include the verses, the chorus, as well as a 24 bar count off section that the Beatles plan to use a bit differently in the future. Here they knew they wanted orchestration. Here they knew how long they wanted this orchestration to occur in the song. And with the inclusion of an alarm clock that John Lennon had brought into the studio one day and the ever faithful counting of Mal Evans in the studio to count off those 24 bars and the decision to pull that alarm clock at the 24th bar that caused an alarming effect that would fit so well into this song that would bring Paul McCartney into the actual writing of the song itself. This is very indicative of the Beatles, taking advantage of every mistake, even to the point of including happy circumstances. It's also important to note here that the Beatles' instrumentation was recorded to only one single mono track. Emmerich knew that there were going to be a whole lot of overdubs. And of course, he was already searching for cleaner sounds, knowing that McCartney was looking in that direction as well. Either way, this single track is a clear and wonderfully produced track. Now you think that the Beatles would have stopped there, but no. The rest of the evening, the Beatles tried several attempts at recording John Lennon's lead vocal for the song. 
Of course, this freed up three tracks for three separate attempts. Recording sessions would continue the very next evening. It was at this session that Emmerich and the team started editing together, or what is known in recording as comping, or comping together the very best takes of John Lennon's vocal attempts. Once comped, this would free up two additional tracks. The basic track that the Beatles first recorded on one track and another track consisting of John Lennon's comped lead vocals. Now at this point, Paul McCartney had been thinking. It was at this session he began going through a notebook that he always carried around that he jotted down music ideas on. And it's at this point that he turned to a little songette, an incomplete idea that he had, that had the lyrics, woke up, got out of bed. Like the first session, Emmerich then recorded onto one track, The Beatles, as a group that would back Paul's vocals on this little bit. Here's where they started getting the idea of splicing bits and pieces together for the song. Here's where they get the idea of splicing the song right at the point where the alarm clock sounds off and splicing in the performance of Paul's little thing. From this point, they could further introduce the other parts of the song. This was the perfect break, and the song itself is a testimony to the power of John Lennon and Paul McCartney as songwriters when truly united. So at this point, three out of four tracks already taken up, John had been thinking about the drums that he wanted on this song. Both him and Paul were very positive on a very powerful drum sound. They wanted a certain flamboyance. Now Ringo was always against flashy drum playing and he even protested at this point. But here with the encouragement and slight twisting of the arm by Paul McCartney and John Lennon, he was encouraged to step up his game. Now a normal drum sound would not do at this point. If you remember in the Revolver Sessions video that we have done, that at one point at the Revolver Sessions, Jeff Emmerich had stuffed Ringo's bass drum with a four-necked sweater a sweater designed for the Beatles for a photo op. Then with an additional close miking, he got a very dead, thud sound that would penetrate in the track. Here, of course, he brought out the same trick, only this time he removed the underheads of Ringo's Tom Toms and Floor Tom. Here, with mics wrapped in towels and perched in glass bottles, he was able to achieve a sound like drums had never achieved before. With Ringo pressed to the wall and coaxed into one of his most magnificent drum performances, the song took on a whole new texture from there. Now it's at the next session that they have a problem. Remember, at this point, all four tracks are full. That means they only have the dead space of tape on the very same track that has John Lennon's lead vocals, and so that only leaves the portion of the track where John Lennon's vocals have been recorded on. There's a short portion where he's not singing anything, right? Because that short portion has been edited in. This freed up them to share Paul's lead vocal for this portion of the song with John's lead vocal for his portions of the song. Now dropping him in is no problem. There's plenty of space to drop in Paul McCartney's lead vocal. The only problem at this point is when Paul gets to the end of his bit with the word dream, that's exactly where John Lennon's ahs come in. This is where the recording team asked Paul McCartney to really cut short the word dream. That's why you hear the word dream ah, one of the very best edits in recording history if you ask me. Now it's at this point that basically the song is complete except for additional overdubs with an orchestra and some true technical magic between two four-track machines, traditionally unsinkable, yet some somehow synced up creates a masterpiece. So this is where we end the video tonight and maybe that'll explain to you why you've gotten this Fab Four Friday for Ray 
a little early this week. In part two, we will cover the rest of the recording of the song, A Day in the Life, as well as additional songs written and recorded during this time, such as Paul McCartney's Fixing a Hole and John Lennon's Good Morning, Good Morning, as well as my very favorite track on the album. All of these are coming up in the next couple of videos. Just a reminder, if you got any value out of this video at all, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the tribe. You just hit that subscribe to the tribe button and then hit that top bell notification and you'll be notified of all future videos. And of course, if you know anybody out there that's interested in Beatle lore, feel free to hit that share button as well. This is The Bottom Line. I'm Michael Nolan, and we'll see you in the next video.